Hi friends, my name is Emily and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be sharing with you my April reading wrap-up. April was a surprisingly good month and I have no idea how I achieved this. The first book that I want to talk about is actually the last thing that I read in March and that is Deathless by Catherine M. Valenti. This is a piece of fantasy literature that was recommended to me when I read the Bear and the Nightingale by Catherine Arden and, oh, what's the other one? Spinning Silver, Naomi Novik. Like, this book came up a lot and I totally get that because we have Russian fairy tales, especially in Catherine Arden's work, that have been drawn on and played with. This is drawing on Russian fairy tales as well. This is about Maria, who is destined to marry, I'm gonna butcher the name, Koschi, the Tsar of Life. It's very much about their tumultuous relationship, the predestination of things, the repetition of certain stories. It's also historical and I feel like I don't know enough about Russian history, like the history of the Russian Revolution, because it's sort of fairy tales and political stuff happening alongside it. The one thing that I found really disturbing is that the relationship between Maria and Koschi is that it's deeply sexual and that she is very young. Before their wedding, she is uh, not an adult. Now the story does span years, so eventually you follow her as an adult, but there's just that little ick factor for me. The writing is beautiful, but the plot feels really messy because we are jumping huge spans of time with each part in the book. The book is divided up into a couple parts. There's a big time jump and sometimes you're in the like actual like historical Russia where there's like magic on the periphery and sometimes you're in the like magical space where these fairy tale figures live and at one point you're in sort of a pocket dimension. It's beautifully written, it kept me engaged, but I read this very quickly in very quick succession, like each of the parts, and I found it really confusing. Maybe not confusing, but like disorienting, I think is maybe a better word, because there were so many changes where all of a sudden you would just have to adjust. I am interested in reading more Russian fairy tales. When I read Catherine Arden, I went on this Russian fairy tales kick and I actually picked up a book of like a collection of Russian fairy tales and I started reading through it and reading this again, I'm like, oh yeah, Baba Yaga makes an appearance and I would love to read more variations on the Baba Yaga fairy tale. I finished this on March 29th. I rated it three out of five stars just because it was a really beautiful reading experience. But at the same time, I don't know that I necessarily enjoyed the complete package. This was from my TBR. It's actually one of my 21 in 2021, so I got to cross that off my list, which is exciting because this has been sitting on my TBR for a while. Depending on what type of reader you are, what you're looking for, this could be a hit or a miss. Like if you like Catherine Arden, you like those vibes, the fairy tale vibes you like when books play with fairy tales and folklore, I think this could be a win for you, but if you're not into sort of disjointed narratives, you might struggle with this one. Then I filmed a Current Reads cleanup in a vlog, and I will try and remember to link that above. I tackled the like 10 things that were sitting on my list. So the first thing that I did was DNF Everything Under by Daisy Johnson. I just couldn't get into it. When I read the marketing for it, it sounds so perfect. It's just too disorienting. So one of the blurbs on the back from The Guardian is Johnson's heady broth of folklore, female sexuality, and Fenland landscape reads like a mix of Graham Swift and Angela Carter. It's based on a myth, and if you are familiar with the myth, apparently that makes this a lot more straightforward, but at the same time, knowing the myth, you could consider spoilers. So I think it depends on what type of reader you are. I did not enjoy this. I'm obviously not familiar with the myth because I struggled to get into this, despite it sounding like a perfect read. This was the first book that I DNF'd in that vlog. Then I finished up the Virago Book of Witches by Sharuk Hussein. So this is a collection of folk and fairy stories that all have to do with witches. They are sort of grouped together by theme of the story. So for example, we have witches in love, possessive women and devoted wives, hungry hags, cannibals and bloodsuckers. And they're from 
around the world, mostly I would say the English-speaking world, and the ones that are not English-speaking tend to be like more vague and broad. The English-speaking ones are like narrowed into a very specific county or area in the UK, but then you'll have like Native American, and you're like, okay, what tribe? Like, what? <laughs> please give me some specificity. So that was a little bit sad. The stories, again, like any short story collection, any like bind up of folk and fairy stories, are hit and miss. I think overall this collection I didn't enjoy, but I'm holding on to because I could see really enjoying this if I had a thesis, if I had a video with a specific purpose in mind, and I mentioned that in the vlog as well. Overall, I wouldn't recommend this as just like fun, casual reading, which is sort of how I picked this up, but I could also see a lot of utility for this. I finished this on April 2nd. I rated it two out of five stars, more based on enjoyment, and this came from my TBR. The next book is a DNF, and I decided to DNF Final Harvest by Emily Dickinson. So in the vlog I mentioned that I believe I picked this up when I was watching the television adaptation Dickinson with Haley Seinfeld. There was a video idea there. I have notes in the back being like, for video. The idea is gone. My interest in this is sort of gone. I wasn't super enjoying the reading experience. I find the poetry has a very repetitious, samey sort of vibe. And again, without an essay, without a thesis, a drive, a reason for reading this, I wasn't enjoying it. And so I decided to DNF this. The next book, that I finished during that vlog is Greek Myths, Meet the Heroes, Gods, and Monsters of Ancient Greece, written by Jean Minas and illustrated by Katie Ponder. So this is for children, I would say 9 to 12. It is like very clean and child appropriate retellings of the stories of the gods and goddesses of Greek myth. It was a fun read. I could definitely see it being a beautiful, giftable item, especially if you have young people who are into Percy Jackson. I finished that on April 3rd. I gave that three out of five stars, and it was from my TBR. And I believe the last book that I finished in that vlog was Refuse Canlet and Ruins, edited by Hannah McGregor, Julie Rack, and Aaron Wonker. So this is following up with the UBC Accountable movement that happened on Twitter in in which one of the professors was accused of being gross and sexual with his students in the creative writing program, and a lot of big name, like celebrity Canadian authors stood up being like, well, I know this person. They could never be gross and abusive of their power. Big names like Margaret Atwood, for example, and then when they were challenged on this, they sort of double down. This incident really highlighted a lot of the issues that exist with in the Canlet space. So this is a collection of essays and poems and like creative pieces reflecting on the Canadian creative writing space and how this space functions, how they feel included or excluded from it, and how they would like to rework it, try and refuse, as in to put the pieces back together and make new and make changes for this next generation of writers. If Canlit is even a thing that they want to continue with, we want to continue with, right? Canlit is a colonial nation building thing. Do we even want to participate in this colonial project anymore, given that it's an exercise in like establishing a culture when many cultures already existed in Canada pre-colonialism. What are we doing? Like, what, what is the purpose of this? And this book asks a lot of questions. It asks you to think a lot about national literature forming an identity around this body of works. Who gets published? Who doesn't? Whose voices are left out? And who doesn't want to be included? Because this isn't a space that they want to be in. It's a colonial space. The last essay in this book, it's called Writing as a Rupture, a breakup note to Canlit by Joshua Whitehead, who is an indigenous author. Their book 
Johnny Appleseed actually won 2021 Canada Reads. Reading the essay made me want to pick this up. So it says Joshua Whitehead redefines what queer indigenous writing can be in his powerful debut novel. Johnny Appleseed transcends genres of writing to blend the sacred and the sexual into the, a vital expression of indigenous desire and love. While I don't know that everybody outside of Canada might enjoy this unless you're studying Canlit, I think if you're studying Canlit you should pick this up. For reasons, a lot of people in Europe seem to be big into Canlit and big into Indigenous Lit. That has been my experience throughout university degrees, that folks in Europe are like weirdly into Canlit and Indigenous Lit. So if you are one of those people, looking at some of the criticism would be good. If not, this is just a moment to spotlight Joshua Whitehead. This is a book that I want to read ASAP. And that's all I have to say about that. It was super engaging, super thought-provoking, and I finished it in like an afternoon. Finished this on April 4th during that clean up the TBR vlog. I gave it a four out of five stars, and again, it came from my TBR. Then I listened to The Flat Share by Beth O'Leary, which was like surprisingly voiced by Carrie Hope Fletcher and somebody else who I didn't recognize, but it was a little bit like shocking at first to have Carrie Hope Fletcher in my ears listening to this. So this is a story of uh, Tiffy, and the man's name really doesn't matter to me, apparently. Anyways, so uh, Tiffy has just got out of a relationship with this dirtbag named Justin, and she needs a place to stay, and she has a very limited pool of money because she works for this sort of indie crafting DIY publisher and so she ends up agreeing to this flat share which is literally a bed share with a gentleman whose name I didn't write down. Um, he works nights, he is a caregiver at a it sounds like maybe a palliative care home and she obviously works a nine to five and so they end up sharing a bed as well as an apartment because neither of them are in the space at the same time, the rent is super cheap, and they begin a friendship through like post-it notes posted around the apartment. You kind of have to suspend your disbelief. The idea that you would never run into anyone ever, like that you wouldn't end up sharing a bed with a stranger at some point, like if somebody gets sick, where are they going to go? Like if they have to take time off work, like you do have to suspend your disbelief. But within the fantasy of this flat share working, I thought it was really cute. There is a more serious note with Tiffy. She sort of comes to see that her ex-boyfriend Justin was abusive and gaslighting her a lot. I think she ends up in therapy for it actually. The one thing that's a little bit odd to me is that this is marketed as a romance. The characters are obviously sort of developing this intimate relationship via post-it note and they come to share a lot with each other and do begin to develop feelings for each other because of this intimacy of sharing while never meeting. They don't actually spend a lot of time together because of the setup of the book and I find that a little weird, and I think if you're going into it expecting like a Talia Hibbert sexy modern romance, you might be disappointed, so I think you need to know that it's a romance where the characters don't interact all that much. Finished that on April 9th, I gave that four to five stars. It was really fun, it was very cozy and happy making, and I borrowed that from my library through Libby. Next book that I want to talk about, I feel like maybe needs a whole video. I really enjoyed the Monster She Wrote book that was put out by Valancourt Books. They republish a lot of forgotten horror, out of print horror, and I think it's a really cool idea, especially with them focusing on women's voices. I've been purchasing and pre-ordering the whole series as it came out, and unfortunately I didn't read them until I'd already owned four of them. Now I'm a little bit worried because Nightmare Flower by Elizabeth Engstrom is such a beautifully crafted collection. I struggle with short story collections. I struggle with more misses than hits, and there were so many based on the writing and the premise and the twist that were hits. However, there is a significant number of these stories where the twist 
is incredibly ableist. And I posted about this on Instagram and a lot of people were like, is there no like introduction? Like this is a, a reprint. You would think in the introduction they would address this and be like, hey, these, these are well written, but this was published like 30 years ago. It's very much of time and place. Like this is why this isn't okay. And there's nothing. And I actually wrote a significant number of pages. So I'm gonna briefly go through these and uh, share with you what hinged on some sort of ableist idea. So the story 55 Days of Silence hinged on ableist horror. It's about a woman who is taking care of her husband who has had his circuits turned off. Her husband has acquired an intellectual disability and she is a full-time caregiver now. She decides to do something to get her own circuits turned off so that they can have their circuits turned off together. However, after she makes this choice, the dystopian whatever repairman people come to the house, they realize that the husband's circuits were turned off in error, they turn his circuits back on, they turn her circuits off, and he cares for her for 55 days and then decides, this sucks, I'm out. The horror is that she chose to acquire the same intellectual disability as her husband because she loved him so much and then he has his circuits turned back on and he's just like, nope, I wanna go out and meet people and have sex and have fun and I don't wanna care for her. And like, that's the horror. Another story was Will Lunch Be Ready on Time, which is about an abusive father who is sexually abusing his eldest daughter, who again has an intellectual disability. The R word is used. Um, and the sister Meg is described as, quote, looking more R word than ever, end quote, on page 39. Then we have the Pan Man, this like peddler who peddles wares comes to her house and you pay for these items that you buy in like consequences. He leaves this cracked ladle there. She decides to keep the ladle even though that isn't the object that she's bought and the object can't be used until it's paid for. And so her child is born with a cleft palate, a disfigurement, now she can use the ladle. So like the horror twist is that she's finally able to use this ladle that she's always wanted once her child with a crack in it that matches the crack in the label is born. There's the jeweler's thumb is turning green, which is about a jeweler who acquires a disability. He loses one of his hands and he's really struggling with this loss of hand because how can he craft this beautiful jewelry the way he envisions it? And then a full hand starts growing in a wallet that he's gifted and he does this half-assed uh, attempt to sew it to his own wrist, but then the hand is evil and possessed of the murderess's spirit that the hand belongs to, and so he has this body part that is rebelling against him, and that body part eventually cuts off his other hand, and that's the horror. His inability to reconcile his limb difference, his disfigurement, his acquired disability, but that he couldn't just live with a limb difference and learn to make jewelry differently. No, he had to use magic, use this supernatural hand to fix his disability. In Fogarty and Fogarty, it's about a homeless man with mental illness who makes some interesting choices. And then Project Stone is about a woman with a mental illness who lets her son die because she is too anxious to make decisions. So many of the stories in this collection, the horror in some way hinges on something to do with a disability or disfigurement. And I was really disappointed that was not addressed in any way. The writing is beautiful, but the horror for me is more sitting with how grossly ableist this text is. And I am hoping that the rest of these books in this collection, which are, again, republishing old out of print women's horror, don't have a similar theme. I feel like disability is one of those like last things that is still acceptable to publish in this way. Whereas like an explicitly racist text, an explicitly homophobic text, an explicitly sexist text would be 
harder to publish without any sort of like time and place intro, a critical essay at the front, whereas Ability, they're not even thinking about that. I finished that on April 9th. I didn't give it any stars. It came from my TBR. Next book that I read is Wolves of the Kala by Stephen King. This is the fifth book in the Dark Tower series. I read this for the Journey to the Tower patron exclusive book club. We are reading through the series together. This is the most traditional book in the series. It has a very tight contained plot. We actually just had the live show for this last night. It was a lot of fun. I don't really want to say too much about this. It's sort of a western fantasy sci-fi genre soup mishmash of a series that is kind of like Marmite. You either love it or you hate it. And this is a series that I absolutely love from Stephen King and I have enjoyed rereading it. Again, on the ableism train, which I addressed in the live show last night, the plot of this book hinges on fantasy eugenics. The wolves come and take children and they they're sort of like vampires. They eat something, some energy within the children that results in them being ruined, R-O-O-N-T, pronounced like ruined. And these children end up acquiring an intellectual disability and then also a physical disfigurement that seems somewhat akin to giantism. The way that they are treated in the cold open of this book, we have Tian working his root sister like a plow horse in a really rocky field that he wouldn't risk a horse's legs on, but it's totally fine to use his disabled sister who arguably cannot consent, cannot understand that she's putting her own limbs at risk to pull a plow. The way that they're treated, the way that the whole plot revolves around preventing children from acquiring an intellectual disability just feels gross. I finished that on April 17th. It was a reread and I ended up bumping this number down to a two star because of the gross ableism that is the plot of this book. The next book that I read, and actually, again, I was loving, based on the writing, is Lord of the Flies by William Golding. So this is a book, again, it's for the Patreon exclusive book club. It is for May 1st. By the time you have seen this, the live will have already happened, but our May drop-in book club is The Strange Library by Haruki Murakami. Links to the Patreon page in the description box down below if you want to join in these live book clubs. This is a book that I never had to read in high school. I have no prior attachment or feelings towards it in any way, and I was really enjoying it. The writing, like, it was so engaging, like so fast paced, like considering how much I have heard people shit on this book for being a like gross book that they had to read in school, I was expecting like a real slog and that is not the case at all. However, once the boys start to go savage, there was like a click moment where I realized that this is a colonial narrative in which the civilized British way of doing things is clearly packaged as being superior, as being the correct way to do things, because once the boys start to go savage, which is an, an incredibly loaded and racist term, they stop wearing clothes, they stop bathing, they stop building and living in a shelter, they focus on hunt and these tribal chants and murder and violence. There was a line in this book where I was seeing it as colonial, as a colonial narrative, and we got to this line by a character that I generally felt very sorry for, Piggy. Piggy is like the butt of every joke. He is shat on by all of his companions on this island. I was feeling very sorry for Piggy until he said this, quote, which is better to be a pack of painted n-words like you are or to be sensible like Ralph is? A great clamor rose among the savages. Piggy shouted again, which is better to have rules and agree or to hunt and kill, end quote. And that's on page 200 of this book. Like I knew that this book was racist, but then to have this character actually come out and say it speaks to that like colonial idea of moving into African spaces, of needing to civilize the natives um, because their way of life is uh, incorrect, insuperior, 
wow. And I'm almost positive that when this is being taught in schools, the racist implications are probably not being talked about. On top of that, I feel like it really sells men short. The idea that if you leave a bunch of men alone that they're just going to turn into like a dictatorship and murder each other. I find it really hard to buy that none of these boys have younger siblings. The fact that the little ones are just left to run wild and eat whatever they want and experience like sickness and diarrhea and like just cry and weep because they are alone and scared that like older boys, like 12 year old boys, wouldn't look at a six year old and be like, hey bud, I'm a human and you're a human, I can give you some care. Like I, <laughs> I don't buy that children are that unempathetic. I know that empathy is one of those last things to develop, but I don't buy that children are that unempathetic and I don't buy that boys specifically are that unempathetic. I think it really sells boys short. However, this did inspire me to watch The Wilds on Amazon, which is sort of like, what if girls ended up on a deserted island that I really enjoyed? So I would recommend that. Not sure I would recommend this, but I'm very much looking forward to discussing this with patrons because there are so many things happening in this that I want to sort of address and I am excited. Even though I didn't enjoy this, I'm excited to talk about this. So I finished this on April 18th. I gave it zero stars and this was a new buy for that book club. It keeps going, friends! Okay, then I read Delicates. Delicates is a gorgeous 9 to 12 graphic novel by Brenna Thumler. She illustrated an Anne of Green Gables graphic novel that I want to get my hands on. She also did Sheets, which is the first book in this series, which follows Marjorie, whose mom has passed away. Her dad is really depressed and not functioning, and so Marjorie is supporting the family by running their laundromat. In the first graphic novel, um, ghosts keep fucking around with the sheets and the laundry and getting her in trouble. And she ends up befriending that ghost named Wendell. In this book, this is the follow-up where we see Marjorie really trying to fit in with the cool kids. She's in eighth grade, you know, she doesn't want to be alone anymore, but she's sort of fallen in with the wrong crowd. They're kind of cruel, they're bullies. And she ends up not having a lot of time for Wendell, but also not having a lot of time for this new girl who's introduced. Eliza was held behind. Um, she's doing eighth grade for a second time and she she is a big ghost believer. She's desperately trying to photograph ghosts and to prove that they exist, but she ends up sort of being very cruel to Eliza with some actually negative consequences. This took a surprisingly dark turn for such a like cotton candy aesthetic 9 to 12 graphic novel. I was surprised how thoughtful and like emotional this was. I flew through this. I loved it. Whether you are an adult or a young person, I cannot recommend this enough. I finished this on April 19th. I gave this five out of five stars and this was a new buy. This came out recently and it's worth it. Definitely worth it. The next book that I read was Goose Girl by Shannon Hale. So this was recommended to me by Gabby and I'm so glad I finally picked this up because this book is like a warm hug. I don't know why, but this book has serious Tamara Pierce vibes. Tamara Pierce is one of my favorite authors, hugely part of my childhood, hugely part of shaping me as a reader, and very few things give me Tamara Pierce vibes in that same sort of like warm, fuzzy, nostalgic way. This is a book that I had no prior relationship to, but it still gave me that warm, fuzzy feel. So this is about a princess named Anadori, Kiladra Taliana is Lee, the crown princess of Kilindri, who ends up being... is it mutiny? Like, it, it, there's this mutinous swap of like her guards and her handmaid. Ani is being married off to a prince in a different kingdom in sort of a political marriage. The person that she's marrying has never met her, so they don't know who they're getting. So when Celia mutinies, nobody knows. And so it's about Ani working in the city, working with the forest folk, getting to know people in this city as the king's goose girl, very much following the plot points of the fairy tale of the same title. It was just so cute 
and warm and fuzzy and like the magic happening here. The people speak, the animals speak, the nature speak. Seeing Ani make friends and develop confidence and learn about the people, I really enjoyed. I will say that I started reading Anna Burning, which is the second book in this Books of Bairn series, and I don't love it as much. And I feel like it's maybe because this is pitched as a series, but we're switching protagonists. We're following a side character from this book, and I don't love when series do that. And I don't know if it's just in the marketing, like if it was pitched to me as a shared universe, the Bayern universe, if I would have been more okay with it. But going from this to picking up the Anna Burning audiobook from my library, I just don't love it as much. If you are a Tamora Pierce fan, you want to try and achieve those warm fuzzy Tamora Pierce vibes, I would recommend picking up Goose Girl by Shannon Hale. I finished this on April 20th, I gave it four to five stars, and this came from my TBR. All right, the most recent book that I finished and the last that I'm going to talk about today is Kate and Waiting by Becky Albertalli. This is the latest book by Becky Albertalli. It's from Kate's perspective, and she is very codependent, almost like, very codependent is the best way to describe it with her best friend Anderson who is out and gay and they always have the same crushes on boys and so the two of them have this crush on this boy named Matt who they meet at camp who they figure they're never gonna see again but then surprise Matt moves to the town that they live in and attends their school and there is this love triangle with Kate and Andy both fighting for Matt's affection like that's the main plot I I'm disappointed in this because all throughout this, Kate and her group of friends identifies the popular kids as fuck boys and fuck girls. And from that definition that we sort of get a sense of in the text, a fuck boy and a fuck girl are essentially just the popular kids. They're the kids who care about how they look. They're the kids who sort of get around, they party, they have a good time, they sports. They're on the sports teams, they're the cheerleaders for the sports. Deeming them fuckboys and fuckgirls is just a shorthand, a new way to repackage calling them sluts and whores. And I didn't love it. Specifically, how judgmental Kate is of this, and like it's never addressed. So we have Kate, who's going to, I believe, a football game at this point, quote, As for me, I'm wearing a flippy blue skater skirt, black tights, brown ankle boots, and a gray sweater cropped right at the waist of my skirt. If I were an F girl, I'd be all in with that crop top. But since I'm me, I've got a white t-shirt tucked in underneath. Reyna says that's acceptable and I look hot and I should let my hair down, end quote. And that's on page 263. So there's this value judgment, like, oh, I'm not a slut. I'm not an F girl because I'm wearing a t-shirt under my crop sweater. No skin, no stomach bearing outfit look for me because I'm morally superior seems to be the implication. And then she goes to a party where um, one of the F girls is wearing high-waisted shorts and a shirt cropped so it could legit be a bra. And that's on page 303. So again, there's this, this judgment in the way that Kate thinks about F girls, that her shirt is so short that it could be a bra. And again, we get this judgment like, ooh, she's a slut, she's a whore, look at her, bearing her midriff, how dare she. Later, Kate and this boy that she likes are talking about how he uses alcohol to deal with his social anxiety. It sort of loosens him up, allows him to relax with other people. And she says, oh, I have social anxiety too. And he's like, but I don't see you drinking and making an ass of yourself. And she goes, yeah, because I'm not a fuck girl. The judgment of like socially drinking wearing tight clothing, wearing popular clothing. It just feels very slut shamey. It feels like Mean Girls addressed this like 15 years ago, that like we can't keep calling each other sluts and whores. Like Kate is totally cool with her best friend finding a boyfriend and being gay and, and having friends come out to her and having a trans friend in their group, like no big deal. Like it's so accepting. But then the girls who are embracing their sexuality, who um, are aware of their desire and acting on it, they're not empowered, they're reduced to being fuck girls. It's just repackaging women as sluts and whores. I'm not okay with that. I don't think that's a good message for 
young people to be receiving. If it was just like a one-off, like, oh, like this guy at this party, he's such a fuck boy, whatever, it comes up so often to the point that you would think it would be a bigger deal within the story and like it would be challenged or addressed. These characters would be presented as more nuanced in the way that Albert Halley's works are constantly portraying queer life as more nuanced. And that just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. And I'm disappointed. Like, I gave this book two out of five stars, I believe, on Goodreads because of this slut shamey through line. I can't ignore it. And I've never had this feeling from a Becky Abertalli book before. Like, her books always feel like a warm hug, like a safe place, and this just feels gross. That was a new buy. That was a pre-order. It was a, a highly anticipated pre-order as well. So I finished that on April 24th. I gave it two to five stars, like I mentioned. I'm not cool with slut shaming. I, I don't like that that ideology is built into this book because it's one step away from like, oh, those girls, they deserved it. Like, they were asking for it, for running around at these parties in their crop tops and their bodycon dresses. They were asking for it because they were drinking and having fun. It's part of that rape culture ideology to label an entire group of girls who just wear popular clothes, who are confident in their bodies and their sexualities as fuck girls. Like, it's, it's one step away from that and it's gross, especially in young adult literature. I think it's really important how we think about and depict young people's sexuality, young people's body confidence, and their autonomy, and their agency over their bodies, and this is unacceptable. This is an incredibly long video. You're welcome. <laughs> and April isn't over yet, but uh, we'll save whatever I managed to achieve on this like roll of reading for another video. Let me know your thoughts on any of these books in the comments down below. I would love to hear from you if you have read any of these, if you have any of the same issues with some of these books as myself. Like I mentioned before, the patron book for May is The Strange Library by Haruki Murakami, which actually works out well if you are following along with Cindy Reads. She is hosting the Asian Lit Readathon throughout May. I will leave Cindy's video linked down below as well. So if you want to read some Asian Lit, participate in that readathon, and then also join me for the book club discussion. Not a part of Cindy's readathon, it's just a, a patron perk that we do uh, drop in book clubs each month. The links for everything will be in the description box down below. All of the books that I talked about today will be mentioned in the description box down below. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you to my patrons who make videos like this possible. I really appreciate the work that they enable me to do. I hope you are all doing well, that you are staying safe, that you are following the rules of the lockdown. I really want this lockdown to end. I just need people to follow the rules so we can stop the spread and like eventually life can return back to normal. I could see my family again. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> uh, anyways, have an excellent day and I will see you soon. Bye!